Napoleon thought he could be great because he founded his empire upon force. Perhaps it's worth considering his words of warning toward the end of his life. He said, Alexander, and that, by the way, is the great, Caesar, Charlemagne, and myself founded empires. But on what did we rest the creations of our genius upon force? Jesus Christ alone founded his empire upon love, and at this hour, millions of men would die for him. Each of the names mentioned, including Napoleon's, made himself an open demonstration of their character by their deeds. In other words, they demonstrated who they were by what they did. God has also demonstrated who he is by his actions. Let's uh, begin with Romans chapter 5 in verse 8 as we consider the communicable attribute of God's love. Romans chapter 5 in verse 8, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the open display, the demonstration of your love for mankind. Help us to appreciate that as we work through the sermon, and then also to know how we are to respond, how we are to imitate your love. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our first point, God has demonstrated his love for mankind. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8 clearly shows that God has a profound love for mankind. John 3.16 would echo that thought. There in John 3.16, those beautiful, priceless words, and I pray they don't just flow off of our lips, but also that they resonate in our hearts. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God displayed his love for all of mankind by giving us Jesus Christ. But how about Jesus Christ himself? Uh, Would you turn with me to John chapter 13? Let's uh, go to John 13, thinking about the last night of Christ's life on earth. Now, all four Gospels cover Jesus's last night on earth, but only John gives us six chapters concerning that last night. There is an aroma of roasted lamb in the air. Why? Because it is Passover. But there's also the aroma of death. And this is what John 13, verse 1 states. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The Greek says, ace talos, love them to the utmost. He had been with these same men, for approximately three and a half years. And now, just before he dies, he's going to do something astounding. He's going to wash their feet. But this is so much more than a foot washing. Jesus, who was about to lay down his life for his friends, will expect them to do the same for one another when he is gone. So Jesus washes 24 feet. That's a 24-foot long message, (laughs) is it not? Literally. But then down in verse 15, Jesus gives us a statement, and these words to me are just so interesting. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to use. Again, so much more than just washing feet. As I am willing to lay my life down for you, 
you need to do the same. And then in verse 17, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. It doesn't say blessed are those to whom you do it to, but rather you are blessed. Why? Because it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. What a love Jesus Christ displayed to his disciples. Catch Paul's words from Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Continuing with more of Paul's words, Ephesians chapter 2, picking it up in verse 1. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. What does it mean in trespasses? It's a dative of sphere. In the realm of your trespasses and sins, what what were you? You were spiritually dead, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. That's a Hebraism, to be the son belonging to the category of disobedience among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. Now we have the contrast, and we'll zero in on two of the attributes. But God, who is rich in mercy, attribute number one, mercy, because of his great love, with which he has loved us. God, in his love for us, displayed mercy and also his tremendous love for us. Perhaps you recognize, uh, at least football fans, the name Warren Sapp. He was an immense man. He played defensive end. When he was explaining his devotion to his coach, Tony Dungy, this is what he said. I would take a bullet for him if it wouldn't kill me. (laughs) Jesus, if you will, took a bullet for us, and it did kill him. A tremendous act of love. So God has demonstrated his love for mankind. Here we go. It's a communicable attribute of God. Something's expected of us now. What is it? Number two, we must demonstrate our love for God. I want to point out there will be several ways in which we do this, but we must demonstrate our love for God. Number one, by obedience. Obedience. John 14, 15, staying in the same account. Remember, we looked at the foot washing in John 13. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. That's true. If we love him, we will be obedient to the word of God. 1 John chapter 5, verse 3, for this is the love of God. Love of God. It's not a subjective genitive, love from God, but an objective genitive, our love for him. Consider uh, that we are to love God. How? by keeping his commandments, and his commandments are not heavy or burdensome. Now, let's transition to the Old Testament for just a moment. I want to talk about a character, but let me uh, give us a, a verse before to take us to him. In Isaiah chapter 41, verse 8, But you, Israel, are my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the descendants of Abraham, my friend. Live the Hebrew could be translated, my beloved. Abraham is considered a friend or beloved by God. Why did Abraham have such a cherished relationship with God? We learn from Genesis chapter 22 in his display of his salvation. Remember, he is declared righteous much earlier in the book of Genesis. Uh, We have learned from Genesis 15 and verse 6 that when Abraham put his faith in the promises of God, God declared him 
righteous. But it's not until years later when he is challenged to give the greatest offering of his life, that promised seed that he had waited so long for. And in Genesis 22, when he takes the knife and he's ready to plunge it into Isaac, the voice comes that says, for now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Now that's obedience, is it not? And it's a display that Abraham was the beloved of God because he kept God's commandment. In John 15, 14, Jesus says, you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. And the I command there is emphatic. Jesus is saying that strongly, if you do whatever I myself command you. I'd heard a story of a missionary on a foreign field. His assignment, translate the word of God into the local tongue. He was working on finding an equivalent for the word obedience and was struggling. One day after a long, long day, (laughs) he came home very discouraged because he could not find the word he was looking for. As he entered his property, his dog came to this missionary tail wagging. The missionary picks up a stick, tosses it, and the dog went and retrieved it. And then a local man who had seen this said, your dog is all ears. The missionary had his word now for obedience being all ears. Ears. That's what it is because we're totally open. Our ears are open to the word of God and to do what he commands us to do. So we must demonstrate our love for God by obedience. And that's such an important concept in the word of God. But also we demonstrate our love for God by loving God's word. I'm going to go back to that chapter that so beautifully describes the Word of God, Psalm 119. Would you turn with me there? And let's look at several references in Psalm 119 about loving God's Word. Verse 47, and I will delight myself in your commandments, which I love. Do you love the Word of God? Do you cherish the Word of God? Do you delight yourself in the Word to the extent that you can't wait to obey it? The psalmist has that mindset. Come down to verse 97. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Then in Psalm 119, 119. You put away all the wicked of the earth like dross. Therefore, I love your testimonies. And one last reference, 159. Consider how I love your precepts. Revive me, O Lord, according to your loving kindness. But consider how I love your precepts. It was Charles Spurgeon who gave us the following quote. A Bible which is falling apart usually belongs to someone who isn't. (laughs) It's so very true. You've got to love the Word of God. So we must demonstrate our love for God by, number one, obedience, number two, by loving God's Word, and then number three, by loving our neighbor. There is an Old Testament verse that is picked up upon often in the New Testament. It's Leviticus 19, 18, to love your neighbor as yourself. Many New Testament writers pick up that concept. Uh, In Mark chapter 12, Jesus had been engaged by a scribe, and the scribes asked which is the first commandment of all. That was a debate in Jesus' day. Uh, The students of the Word would often discuss, when you look at the entire Old Testament, which commandment stands out more 
than any other. And Jesus says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. But then there is something added here that connects the two. In Mark chapter 12 and verse 31, and the second, like it. It means to be equal to, the same as the other. And which commandment is that? You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Again, it's easy for anyone to say, I love God because God is invisible and who really knows? Well, you know by how you treat your visible brother. And that's what our Lord Jesus Christ is getting at. And speaking about our neighbor, (laughs) know the story well, the good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan from Luke chapter 10. Jesus tells a story, perhaps it actually occurred, of a man who was descending from Jerusalem to Jericho. It would be about a 17-mile trek. You descend approximately 3,000 feet. It is known that hiding behind the rocks could be bandits. So what does Jesus do? He picks up on a, a common situation. And he gives a tremendous story about a priest who sees a man who had been beaten, lying there half dead. And what does the priest do? Practices Leviticus 19.18? No, he goes by on the other side. Priest should know better. Priest was to teach the people. And here comes the Levite. Same situation. Someone who knew the law, uh, would understand the essence of the law, did the same thing. And oh, I imagine the Jewish eyes got really big when Jesus then gives the hero of the story, a Samaritan, someone that was despised by the Jews. The Jews traditionally went around Samaria because they just did not like them because they were half Jewish. And then they also derived from the Assyrian captivity with a mix of people way back in about 722 BC. So these are a hated people, but what does he do? He is the one who takes care of the man that had been brutally beaten, lying at the point of death, took money out of his own pocket to make sure that this man's needs had been cared for. And then Jesus says, well, out of the three, who who is the neighbor, (laughs) the one who had done the good deed, the one who made the display openly of love. And that's what the Samaritan did. I live on a street that's multi-ethnic. I have people from all around the world uh, living on my street, Haiti, Central America. And I have a friend uh, there from Central America, the country of El Salvador, a country that I had visited many years ago and had served in. And my neighbor had a need. He had come to the country, was going through the citizen process, and asked me if I could do a letter showing that his wife, who was clearly with him ever since I had known them, was legitimately with him and and a wife. So I was more than glad to write the letter for my my Salvadoran friend. And uh, eventually his wife uh, came into citizenship too. Beautiful story. But I had learned during the process that this man from Central America had asked one of my other neighbors uh, to do the same. And that man refused to help his neighbor. And then one day suddenly that man died who refused to help him unexpectedly. And I'm going, you never know when the opportunity will no longer exist for you to love your neighbor as yourself. Certainly something we need to think about. So we must demonstrate our love for God by obedience, by loving God's word, by loving our neighbor. And it gets difficult at times in a Christian life because now it's by loving our enemy, loving our enemy. Let's go to the first book of the New Testament, the Gospel of Matthew, uh, to chapter 5, which is uh, 
moving through the Sermon on the Mount. Here in Matthew chapter 5, let me read verses 43 through 47, and then I'll give some comments after that. Matthew chapter 5, coming down to verse 43. You have heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so. So coming now back down to verse 43, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Notice Jesus doesn't say this comes from Scripture, because half of it does. The first half. And what is the first half? You shall love your neighbor, Leviticus 19, 18. But in the Old Testament, it doesn't say you should hate your enemy. So what does Jesus do? He shows the heart of the law. He shows the essence of the New Testament as well. We are to love our enemies. We are to care for those who despise us because they first hated Christ and now they hate us. What's the example of God? What does God do every day? He gives sunshine to the just and the unjust alike, right? And then the same with the rain. Our God shows a lot of mercy and kindness and love to saved and unsaved a lot. And we are called to imitate this as well. There was a son who came home one day with two black eyes. His dad thought, whoo, what happened here? How did it happen, son? The son said, it's your fault, dad, because of what I've learned in family devotions. <laughs> the dad was taken aback and said, well, what do you mean? son. Well, dad, you had taught us from the Bible that if someone slaps you on the cheek, you should turn the other cheek. Oh, one eye blackened, so I allowed the second one to be black. But don't worry, dad, I hit him really good. The dad said, well, why did you do that? The young man said, well, I also learned that in devotions from you. He then proceeded to quote Ecclesiastes chapter 9 in verse 10. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. <laughs> it sounds like the son had been sitting at the feet of the scribes and the Pharisees uh, learning about love and hate, does it not? I thoroughly enjoy the quote from Martin Luther King Jr. I have decided to stick with love. Hate is too great a burden to bear. And how true is that? And then finally, in our second point, we must demonstrate our love for God by loving one another. That one another expression appears all over the New Testament, and it's such an important concept because we are to love one another. First Peter chapter 4, would you turn here, please, going toward the book of Revelation, past James, over to First Peter chapter 4, coming down to verse 8. Notice the emphasis that Peter will give in this reference here. And by the way, this is nothing new uh, to Peter, because when you study in Second Peter about the things that will cause you to grow, he ends the list with that of love. So we find a parallel with First Peter 
as well as 2 Peter, but we're emphasizing here 1 Peter 4, 8, and above all things, I mean, that's quite a statement, above all things, have fervent love. And fervent carries the idea of the stretch out. It means continually and intensely to do this. And above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. What are you really like? <laughs> Perfect or imperfect? The latter, as I am the same. And what are we supposed to extend to those who are like us in this Christian journey? Love. Why? Because they are not perfect as we are not perfect. And that's what Peter's saying. Above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. See, it's, it's just not critical of others. It understands that as I struggle, that person struggles. So you demonstrate the tremendous love of God to even struggling Christians by showing them a fervent love. And then 1 John chapter 4, 7 through 9, beloved, let us love one another. There's our one another, right? But love one another. Why? For love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God. Why? For God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. So the exhortation to love one another, because this is the essence of God, and it should be our practice reflecting the very nature of our God. So how do we demonstrate our love for God? Well, God demonstrated his love for us by parting with his most precious possession, his own son. But God demonstrates his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Remember that? Romans 5, 8. Or for God so loved the world, all of mankind, that he gave, see the sacrifice, his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So as a result of that, we can demonstrate our love for God by obedience. We need to be people who are all ears, like the dog that fetched the stick for the master. We are called to be obedient in all things, and this is how we demonstrate our love for God, but also by loving his word. This is a prized possession. We need to be individuals who are given to the book. Let's love the word of God and make that a priority by loving our neighbor as well. Who's your neighbor? It's the individual with need. The individual that was beaten was by the side of the road was the individual that was neighbor to the Samaritan. He's also the neighbor to the priest and the Levite, but they bypassed doing what they should have done. So let's love our neighbor. And this is also how we show the world that we love God. And then also by loving our enemy. Uh, let's not be like the young man who misapplies the word of God as the scribes and Pharisees and to strike back. No, we need to pray for those who spitefully use us. We need to be individuals who even learn to bless those who would curse, because is that not what our Lord Jesus did? Upon the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That's love. And then as Jesus washed the disciples' feet, setting an example how we should love and lay down our lives for one another. And what does that mean, laying down our lives? It's giving our time, it's giving our resources. 
That is how we demonstrate that we love God when we love our neighbor and love one another. Let's pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father. We so appreciate the love of God. We appreciate you demonstrating your love through the greatest gift, Jesus, who laid down his life for us and took it back up again. And because we have believed in him in taking upon himself our sins, now, Lord, I thank you for the resurrection of Christ, but then also our privilege to now display your love through our actions. Help us to carry these things out. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for watching today's sermon. Uh, there is a book that is the basis for the 14 lessons, Attributes of God on Fire. Uh, there are actually 10 other fire books. So you can learn more about us at ComerManorBibleChurch.com. And then I have a foundation, Ken J. Bird Senior Foundation.com. And finally, we have a father and son podcast. We would love to have you join us. God bless you.